thank you for joining this OncLive Peer Exchange entitled Advanced Head and Neck Cancers, Looking Forward. We've entered a new era in the treatment of squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, owing to improved insights surrounding the underlying biology of this disease and new advances in therapeutic targeting of the immune system. This expert panel discussion will focus on strategies for refining treatment of advanced disease and improving outcomes after recurrence. We'll provide perspective on the latest research findings and their application to clinical practice. I'm Dr. Ezra Cohen, and I'm a professor of medicine for the Division of Hematology Oncology, Department of Medicine at UC San Diego, and the co-director of the Center for Precision Immunotherapy. Joining me for the discussion are Dr. Joshua Baumel, Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Dr. Barbara Burtness, Professor of Medicine at the Yale University of Medicine and co-leader of the Developmental Therapeutics Research Program at Yale Cancer Center in New Haven, Connecticut, and Dr. Jared Weiss, an Associate Professor of Medicine and Section Chief of Thoracic and Head and Neck Oncology at UNC in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Thank you for joining us. Let's first start talking about the biology and the stratification for patients with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, Josh, uh, take us through a little bit about the underlying biology of this disease. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Ezra. Uh, head and neck cancer used to be a relatively homogenous disease. It was caused largely by exposure to tobacco and alcohol, but now we're seeing more and more subgroups for head and neck cancer. The one that is affecting most Americans is human papillomavirus, or HPV. At this point, it is the leading cause of oropharyngeal head and neck cancer. And patients with HPV-associated head and neck cancers have a different epidemiology. They tend to be younger, they tend to be healthier, and they have a much better prognosis. At this point, though, HPV, or as it's measured by its surrogate marker, P16 positivity, is only a prognostic marker. It's not used as a predictive marker to choose the treatment, but still it harkens to the idea that maybe we should be treating these patients differently given their underlying biology. And some emerging data is finding that there's different molecular profiles for patients who have HPV positive versus HPV negative head and neck cancers with differential mutations in those two subgroups. And we know now that there are, as you alluded to, different genetic drivers uh, potentially of, of these two subsets and in fact of uh, uh, individual uh, head and neck cancers. Uh, Jared, can you talk a little bit about um, the genetic drivers of this disease and uh, are any of them uh, actionable? Are, are they things that we should be paying attention to? Well, there's a definite answer to that of maybe. <laughs> so traditionally, in terms of trying to decide what to do, we look to stage. The T stage, or the size and invasiveness of the tumor, the N stage, the number of nodes. And this told us uh, if we're going to do definitive radiation, whether to add chemotherapy to that. Postoperatively, Postoperatively, we looked at pathologic features such as extra capsular extension and margins, perhaps some other things, to decide who we were going to add chemotherapy to radiation. We now live in a world where we have multiple good modalities to treat head and neck cancer. So for example, in oropharyngeal cancer, we have all of these wonderful advances in radiation, such as IMRT and perhaps protons and better systemic uh, agents to consider adding. Um, and in the world of surgery, we have these new transoral surgeries that, as a theme, have less morbidity, uh, fewer functional and cosmetic defects, blood loss on par with a blood draw, uh, less hospital time. And we find ourselves in a world and saying, okay, with all of these pathologic features, these stage-based features, these biologic features, what as clinicians can we really drill down to and use to decide what we're going to do, right? That's what we care about at the end of the day. What should we do? Um, and there's really not a lot of absolute definition. There's a ton of conversation about HPV as a prognostic biomarker. It is clear that no matter what you do, the HPV positive patient does better than the HPV negative patient. Um, at ASCO this year, there was an interesting abstract looking at biologic characteristics and clinical characteristics of oropharynx patients, trying to say, can either of these predictors alone, the stage 
the biology or perhaps a combined score better predict who should be uh, treated uh, radiotherapeutically and who uh, might benefit from escalation to inclusion of surgery. And there was a suggestion that a combined score of P16, um, high-risk HPV DNA, survivin, uh, and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes might predict a population of oropharynx patients that would perhaps uh, do better with surgery. It's important to remember that not all of these measures are clinically available. There isn't a test you can order that gives you all of this at once. So I see this as kind of an introduction to a story, not the end of the story, as a suggestion that we want, may one day dividing patients between surgery and radiotherapy therapeutic approaches, not necessarily by stage or just by expected functional deficit, but perhaps eventually biology might, might empower us in the clinic to know who really needs surgery, who really needs radiation.